This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. I think I may be the most happily surprised person in the crowd right at this moment, because I'm here, I was uh, appearing in the previous panel in my role as James Fallows. Here I'm appearing as James Bennett, the editor of the magazine, who was going to be here having the privilege of doing the interview with uh, Stacey Snyder, but he's someplace in the clutches of United Airlines between uh, Denver and San Diego at the moment. So I've gotten the opportunity to instead lead this conversation with a fascinating figure in the field of enterprise and innovation that we all are shaped by and we all, all are con concerned with. So that's going to be the plan for the next while. I'm going to have a discussion with Stacey Snyder. We'll bring you all in as we did in the previous panel. And let me tell you a little bit just to set up why uh, I am so much anticipating this, uh, this, uh, this encounter. Stacey Snyder is the co-chairman and the CEO of DreamWorks Studios, which she runs along with her partner, Steven Spielberg. Since joining the studio in 2006, she's overseen a diverse slate of films that have included both critical and box office successes, including The Help, War Horse, Sweeney Todd, and Tropic Thunder. DreamWorks' next film, Lincoln, which we're going to talk about, directed by Spielberg and starring Daniel Day-Lewis, opens next month. I think many of you, if you watch the debates, perhaps the least agonizing part were some of the, uh, the, the, the previews of this film. Stacy began her career in the mailroom and ascended to the executive ranks at Goober Peters Entertainment, TriStar and Universal Pictures, where she served as chairman of the studio. She's overseen such films as Philadelphia, Sleepless in Seattle, Aaron Brockovich, Jerry Maguire, Brokeback Mountain, Out of Sight, Eight Mile, and Lost in Translation. For my money, the best movie ever about Japan, among many others. She's also launched popular franchises from the movies The Born Identity, The Fast and the Furious, Meet the Parents, and Bridget Jones' Diary. All of us pride ourselves as generalists. I think we see a kind of range of, of uh, genres, ranges of, of sensibilities that you've been responsible for, and so it's a real privilege to be able to ask you about them. Let me start with a segue from our previous panel, which is all about presidential politics. You're about to put out a very big movie about probably the greatest president in, in our history. How does a movie like Lincoln get made in the current movie environment? What should we know about how this picture came to be? Uh, well, the the movie has had a, a long, um, uh, a long history. Uh, Stephen read Doris Kern Goodwin's book *Team of Rivals* when it was in galley form. So this is now ten or eleven or twelve years ago, and loved it, and had always wanted to make a movie about Lincoln, and uh, and he bought the galleys, and that then set about getting a screenplay written, which is the next step in in any movies process and the first couple scripts that that we had and it's funny because I was at Universal when he f first bought the right so this is how far back it goes the first uh, set of scripts were the kind of traditional biopic birth to death including you know the entire Civil War and besides being non-specific and vast and epic it was utterly unproducible it would have cost you know a hundred trillion dollars <laughs> to make the movie and, and so we were stuck, we were really stumped. And at the same time, we were making a movie with Tony Kushner called Munich, and Tony volunteered to get involved in this endeavor and started from, from scratch. He really did uh, an incredible amount of research on Lincoln's presidency, and then after two years turned in a script that not many people know was 500 pages, and most screenplays are about 120, 130 mm, wow. pages. And I said to Stephen, 
you know, are you mad? You know, were you angry or, uh, for waiting this long to get a 500 page script? And he was like, no, this is incredible. This is fantastic. And, and Tony's writing can certainly elicit that kind of response, but it still wasn't yet a movie. And so they really honed in on this one period of time, which in fact, despite the fact that 15,000 books have been written about Abraham Lincoln, this one period of time has actually never received scholarly treatment. And some of the Lincoln scholars who advised us said that Tony's script is so specific and well-researched and unique, it would be a candidate for scholarly accreditation. In any event, they focused in on uh, the debate to pass the 13th Amendment while at the same time Lincoln was balancing the need to end the Civil War. And he knew that if he yielded to that humane and, and natural impulse, the South would re-enter mm -hmm. the Union and the chance for the passage of the 13th Amendment would die. However, if he didn't c consider the interests of the Democrats who wanted to bring the war to an end, he'd never even get a few crossover votes that he needed. So really the movie is a look at um, leadership and, and a very modern look at the messy uh, process of democracy. As you describe the substance this movie is going to go into, of course it's from a, a big studio, has, has a big star and many stars in it, how do you balance something that, that is a worthy project? You're talking about a very uh, dense part of American history with the need to fill the movie houses around the world. How, how, do, how do you assess those things? Um, well, really, in any movie, you know, it's a balance between art and commerce, and, and that means trying to anticipate the size of the audience with the cost of the movie. So, you know, with a movie like this, um, while we have marketing efforts that are aimed at reaching beyond what we consider to be the core audience, the core audience we know is going to be adult um, smarty pants. <laughs> and so we have to then limit the budget. And Stevens, he's pretty disciplined about that. You know, he'll, he knows that people are inclined to say yes to him. And so he puts himself in, in a budget box. He creates his own parameters and forces us to get in the box with him. So his production designer, uh, the cast, uh, the, the composer, all have to find ways to, to chip away at their budgets in order to fit in. So the movie is, is modestly budgeted. It's not a low budget independent film, but it's not budgeted near what a blockbuster or a pole or what you'd expect a Spielberg movie to cost. And then I guess the, the, the important consideration to, to get people to come is to cast it within an inch mm -hmm. of its life. And so um, there's 140 speaking parts in the movie, and every performance is impeccable, beginning and ending with the great Daniel Day-Lewis playing Abraham Lincoln. We all, and so when does this come out? The movie comes out November 9th limited, November 16th wide. Great. Uh, so all of us are familiar with the output of your work. As I read the l this list of films, we've all seen and, and, uh, and really enjoyed those. I think very few of us have a sense of what you actually do, what the, what the input mixture is. What, what is it like to be a studio executive and what would surprise most of us? You sound like my dad who <laughs> says, why isn't, what do you do? And, wh and why is your, isn't your name on, on the screen and why does Steven Spielberg listen to you? I don't get it. Um, so you what can think of me as dad. dad. I mean, yes. <laughs> what, my, my de what a studio executive does, different than what a producer does, is a studio executive is, is a creative financier. I mean, ultimately, most we're the bank. We are the bank, and some studio executives play the role, and w especially more in the old days when the movies weren't quite as expensive. You'd hire a producer to go make the movie for you and bring it back according to the screenplay that, that was assigned to the producer and for the budget that was given. And, you know, obviously there are great examples of, of creative studio executives from Irving, you know, Thalberg to Daryl Zanuck all the way up through the ranks. Um, but mostly studio executives are, are supervising a broad slate of films and making sure that the projects are sourced, that we're developing enough screenplay so that we have a slate of movies and making sure they are proceeding apace. 
we plan the budgets and set the budgets and say this movie is going to cost 20 and this will cost 60. And we supervise the packaging of the movies, which means we'll make the movie with Daniel Day, Sally, and Tommy Lee Jones, but not Don Rickles and this one and that one. <laughs> and then, and then we're not on location. I mean, we go and, uh, and visit, I visit all of our films to make sure that people know that we love them and care about their work, that we're watching, you know, De Niro. <laughs> I, I've got you in my <laughs> eyesight. And um, if there are problems. But production has never been an interest of mine. And most studio executives don't sit on sets all day long. They're working on the next batch of movies. And then a studio markets and distributes the movie. So when you see the TV spots and the trailers and theater posters, etc., those are created by the studios. So if I had a similar discussion with a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, he or she would say that if one-tenth of their bets pay off, they feel successful because the, the rewards of the one that succeeds outweigh the nine that molder along. How is it for you all? How many of, what, what's, a success, what's a reasonable success ratio of your well, bets? Well, you know, it used to be that we could approach the business, you know, as a portfolio. Mm -hmm. and, and so you'd make, you know, when I was at Universal, we made 18 movies, maybe 16, you know, let's say 16 from the big studio and, and six or seven or eight from the small studio focus. That's where movies like Brokeback mm -hmm. and uh, Lost in Translation were made. And, and you'd approach it as a portfolio slate of films. It's changed in the last couple of years and it is more and more hits driven. And so we can't have that kind of approach to it. So the curating of a film slate, the really, you know, picking the hits, you know, controlling the costs and mitigating losses are, are, are uh, much more crucial these days. There's attention for, for our audience through other means. And is this a change in the financial landscape or is it a change in the intellectual or attention landscape of people? What, what's forcing this change in how you approach the business? I think it's really a question of, of other alternatives. Yeah. You know, I have a 16-year-old and 13-year-old daughter, you know, my two girls, and they're just not habituated to going to movies like I was um, as a kid. That mm -hmm. was just what we did. They have other things to do, and, and they have other ways to be in touch with their friends. They're, they're actually, I have to find ways for them not to be in touch with their friends. Whereas for me, <laughs> you know, Friday night, yeah. that was my social time. And so what then are you, well, for example, of the great movies you made in the past, are there some that you wouldn't be able to make now, do you think, in this different, uh, any of them you can, what, Aaron Brockovich or what? Yeah, Aaron Brockovich I couldn't make then either, except, <laughs> um, <laughs> except that we got Julia Roberts. Yeah. You know, th that was a movie that easily just could have been a TV movie. There was nothing cinematic about the story, really. There was nothing that required the big screen treatment, except that at that point, there still were movie stars, you know, and there still were destination actors that you'd make a point to go see, and Julia was, a, was one of them, a big star. So, um, yeah, you know, I was telling um, James about a movie I made way back in the day called One True Thing mm -hmm. that I loved. It was with Meryl Streep and Re Renee yep. Zellweger. It was based on an Anna Quinlan yep. novel, or actually it was a memoir, I think, about her taking care of her own mom. And, and uh, it was a moving story about a, a high-powered, kind of hard-driving young woman who had never really gotten along well with her mom and decided to, to come back and care for her while she was struggling with cancer. And it was a, a, a small drama and a, with great actors. And that's a movie that I think would, would be really challenging to make in, in, in this day because it's just too easy to wait for that movie on Netflix and, or... or uh, you know, pay television, and we can't make enough m money that way to cover the costs. And so, in the future, will these be made by TV networks? This kind of movie just not be made? Well, I think what we're seeing now, like I just watched a great movie the other night on Apple TV called Arbitrage mm -hmm. yep. with Richard Gere and Susan Sarandon, and it was based on a, um, it's got, it's got a kind of made off hint to it, which I was obsessed with that story. And um, they just released it on Apple TV. It won't get a theatrical, but people, you know, I think you pay $2 or something. I don't know what the cost was, but it wasn't that expensive, and they made the movie inexpensively, and they got a very limited uh, theatrical release. So that's, a, that's a, a different model, but it requires the movies to be much smaller, and the actors, therefore, to take a lot less money. 
I'm going to ask about a conjunction that not enough people make in the world, that is between DreamWorks and the Atlantic magazine. <laughs> I think we are similar in this way. I have some of my Atlantic colleagues I hear laughing especially heartily, uh, which is that, that, as you mentioned, there's the, there's the art versus um, commerce uh, balance that, that everybody ha has, to, has to make. Um, you are a very influential female executive in a very powerful global industry. You've mentioned a lot of female stars you're working with and a lot of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of female-themed movies. How do you think we should understand both the female role in the, the, uh, the viewing audience? For example, I think you said that, that teenage girls are more and more a guide to what you make. And feel free to correct any errors you think the Atlantic magazine has made in its presentation of, oh, okay. of women's issues. We were, we were discussing, we were and, and you could leave with that right. if you'd like. Well, I don't want to be utterly critical, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I, 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 I did notice those big headlines, you guys, about, you know, Girls hooking up. Is this ringing any bells? And uh, and, and can't have it all. Can't have it all. Raw. <laughs> See, I hear some rumbling. And um, and uh, you know, look, as a, as a person in the media business, I do understand the allure, uh, if not the absolute requirement, to have provocative, headline-getting headlines, magazine-selling headlines. And those two stories particularly caught my attention. Uh, as a woman, a mother of two daughters who was raised by a mother who marched for women's rights, was a card-carrying uh, feminist, as am I, um, I didn't think, <laughs> I, I didn't think either of those articles did a great job to substantively further the conversation about wim what women yeah still need to accomplish, but they got people talking, and The Atlantic is a wonderful magazine, and I wanted to keep surviving and thriving, and so Thank you. I, uh, <laughs> I accept that those headlines are a necessity in the same way that I have to make um, sometimes, you know, Tropic Thunder. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We can, I, I'll, I'll tell my friend Anne Marie Slaughter, the the, art, the author of Can't Have It All, that she's kind of the Tropic Thunder of our portfolio. No, I think yeah. she will. <laughs> I think she'll be actually she'll but be pleased. I, uh, my last point <laughs> is that the feminist movement did not promise it all. It promised choices. And, and as you think of your industry's presentation of these issues, which movies do you feel sort of most satisfied with and most troubled by about presenting the, the real texture of, uh, of women's place now? Well, look, we, we, there isn't, I can't brag about anything, you know, when it comes to, to the movie business and its treatment of women. I, I can't brag because there's not enough movies that are directed by women, there's not enough movies that are about interesting, real, you know, substantive conversations about women. Um, I feel that, in my position, I can at least cry foul when something comes across my desk. We're working on a movie now um, where the two women in, you know, it's a car racing movie. They couldn't be less ambitious intellectually, um, but the two women in the movie were just arm candy entirely. Mm -hmm. So I can cry foul and say, wouldn't it be interesting if she was, you know, a businesswoman who was brokering uh, car transactions, not pumping gas and you know, hot pants or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I can have an influence that way. You know, we made a movie last year, The Help, which I had great pride in, but I also felt a lot of ambivalence about the fact that, um, you know, a movie with so many wonderful African-American actresses were in uniforms. That bothered me. Um, and yet I did feel that the movie was... Um, well done and hit a chord and encourage conversation in a, in a meaningful way. So um, we have just as many issues, believe me. And, and just to ask about that, that very powerful movie, The Help, looking back on it now, what's been the net response from the African-American community to the movie? Mostly positive, I think. Um, you know, there was certainly an element of um, African-American um, intelligentsia that made the same criticisms I just leveled against you know, our own movie, which was, why in this day and age is this the best that we can find for women like Viola Davis? And, and, and you know, I, I took that on board. Um, and yet, when we took the movie out last summer, you know, knowing that the movie had a lot of commercial uh, knocks against it, it was period, it was all women, it was about civil rights, you know, things that 
can't compete with the Avengers. We showed the movie last summer 350 or 400 oh. times. We did that many word of mouth screenings. I think I hosted about 25 screenings personally. And before we did that, we took it to uh, the NAACP. We took it to many um, affinity groups uh, uh, associated with the African American community and faith-based community and got their stamp of approval. And so we let our advocates advocate on our behalf, and it was the best way to bring that film to market rather than a, you know, than a studio just saying, here, love it. Let me ask you a policy question now. I've spent a lot of my recent life living in China, and the things I noticed about the American moving bu movie business there, are, number one, you could buy any new release the next day for 80 cents, which is a uh, commercial challenge. Um, n number two, it showed the vitality of the American movie industry compared with any of the uh, foreign competitors. And uh, n number three, the kind of the coarseness of the, of the American f uh, films that appealed internationally. How has the growing role of the international market changed what you do and what you will do? Um, well, at DreamWorks, we're only making between you know, four and six movies a year. So I have to make sure that, in general, the movies meet a high enough standard of, of quality and integrity to represent our brand and Steven, who's always a flashpoint, um, but also that promise enough box office and audience appeal that we can pay the rent, you know, so we don't have 18 movies to, um, to source for our revenue. So I, I am thinking about the global market, and I can't make movies, for example, that, um, like I made a movie back in the day, uh, Friday Night Lights, and I made Rudy. When I was at, Uni when I was at Sony, we made Rudy, and when I was at uh, Universal, we made Friday Night Lights. I don't think I could make that movie, huh. either one of those movies now, because um, American sports just might not travel as easily. Making Lincoln was enough of a challenge, but because you have Daniel and Stephen, um, the, the bet that an American president presidential story will travel is somewhat coverable. Um, a totally domestic comedy we made when I was at DreamWorks. Not only did we have Tropic Thunder, but we did <laughs> Blades of Glory. <laughs> Which I, I was, loved. Right? <laughs> and um, I'm not sure, maybe we could do that because it's physical and um, you know that will translate. Yeah. But a just kind of regular boneheaded American comedy, we probably, I did 40 Year Old Virgin <laughs> when I was at, at Universal. And I'm not sure that we could do that. So you're thinking about what, what kind of comedy translate, mm -hmm. what kind of stories yeah. translate. Is there enough physical, is, there, is, is the story told in a physical or, or, or cinematic enough way that it'll translate into um, you know, different cultures? And is there a reason to think, apart from the erosion of actual income you're getting by all these pirated copies, is there a reason to think that, that the United States will lose its role as the center of the world movie industry? The international growth is still vibrant for mm -hmm. us. So notwithstanding the piracy issue that we're facing, the, the growth in the business is international. And you see it in the BRIC countries. Yeah. You know, Russia is a huge market for us now and hadn't been even you know, five years ago. Uh, Latin America, Asia. Um, so we're still seeing growth there. And I don't know a whole lot about movie making in China, but I have friends who do. And what they've told me is that seeing how popular the American f uh, movies are, they're now approaching US studios to really co-finance and co-produce movies. And it isn't, like my friends went there thinking that they'd want to make you know, Pearl Buck novels <laughs> or something. And they said, no, we can do that ourselves. That we know how to do. Yeah. We want to learn how to make superhero movies and action movies. And maybe the idea will be to learn from the Americans and then kick them out later. Yeah. But at least for right now, it feels like there's um, you know, a meaningful uh, approach to co, yeah. you know, co-fi and co-venture.
you know, the, the South Koreans are 25 years ahead on sort of this pop culture phenomenon. I think the popularity of Gangnam Style right now <laughs> illustrates the sort of, uh, it, we're, we're not going to see that from, chi from China for a while. The previous panel, we were talking about the influence of social media on politics, the way that you advertise differently, the way people influence uh, each other uh, differently. You mentioned earlier your, your daughters and how you, uh, they're sort of distracted by all these various media. How do the social media and their rise change what you do? Well, this part of the, of as long as it's not my girls, you know, like this <laughs> all the time, which drives me crazy, um, it's it's a big opportunity for us. And I'll I'll tell you when it really just caught my attention. Two summers ago, I think it was two summers ago, we were at Comic Con, which is the big convention for the comic book uh, fans and and other you know real pop, pop culture fans. And Stephen went there to promote Tintin. We had War Horse also, but he was there mostly to pr promote Tintin. And he was on a stage like this with Peter Jackson, and fans came and asked him questions directly. And it was unbelievably moving to me to see there was a little kid that asked him what was your favorite movie, and he told a story about how he loved all his films, but that if he had to pick one, E.T. would be his favorite, because it was the first time he realized he wanted children of his own, because he was so sad to leave Drew and Henry at the end of the shoot. And for me, it was moving to see his fans have direct access to him. And so the following year, we arranged for him to introduce War Horse by way of a closed circuit interactive conversation with his fans. They watched the movie and then they could ask him questions. So he wasn't disintermediated by all the, you know, junket press, how most people get their information about what Stephen's thinking. And uh, so so that's a, a specific example, but mostly what we're really trying to do is what you guys are trying to do. Um, really speak directly to your readers. We're trying to speak directly yeah. to our, our, our ticket buyers. And let me ask you a version of the question that was asked Steven Spielberg. Of all these wonderful movies you've been associated with, what is your favorite and, and why? Um, I, I love, I, there's so many. I, the only memorabilia I keep is I have my scripts bound after the shoot and signed. I don't keep any of the other stuff, but I love I, I do, you know, keep them all around me. So I, I love them all. But I guess, you know, for me, I do believe that movies can change the conversation. And I love to be entertained, and I love the action movies and scary movies and funny movies. But I do value more the movies that have something to say. So I worked on a movie when I was at TriStar called Philadelphia. Oh, sure. And um, that movie just meant a lot to me. I grew up in Philly. I had to convince Jonathan Demme to shoot the movie called Philadelphia in Philadelphia, <laughs> not, not Nyack, where he lives. And um, the person I worked for at the time didn't want to make the movie because of the subject matter. He actually said to me, are you trying to, you know, are you trying to get me fired? And, um, and we persevered, my colleagues and I persevered and just kind of pushed it through. And Demme was powerful and we got Tom Hanks to do it. And um, the focus groups, what we, what we do after a movie is done is we take it to theaters two, three, four times, and we show it to people who sometimes don't know what they're seeing at all, sometimes know what the movie's about. They'll get a little uh, paragraph. And then we ask them to fill out a, a questionnaire afterwards and then sit for a focus group. And the focus groups following that movie never discussed the movie. They, it was, would be 14 or 20 people talking about their feelings hmm. about tolerance and uh, homophobia. And, and it was great. We never got any information <laughs> about the movie, <laughs> but it was a very stirring experience. And to extend that from a theme from the previous panel where, where people who are expert in politics are p talking about dysfunction, division, hostility within the American electorate. There have been times when the movies in particular have tried to, you know, Frank Capra in the most kind of heavy-handed way, but is that, do you think that your, will your Lincoln film have any kind of uh, unifying effect? And if you were gonna make a unifying movie, what would it be like? Well, here's what's amazing to me about Lincoln is that 
for everybody who rightfully laments that things are bad and polarized and divisive and vitriolic, the movie says, you haven't seen anything <laughs> yet. Yes. You know, we actually had muskets and, and guns pointed yeah. at one another, 600,000 dead, and divisions between the parties, inside the parties, and um, leadership and moral purpose and messy democracy prevailed. So to me, it, it, it couldn't have, it, it, we didn't time it this way. The movie was supposed to get made any time in the last 12 years. Stephen's been struggling to get this movie made. He had Liam Neeson, that didn't work out, the 500-page script, you know, it, but that it came out, that it is coming out now is, 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 is providence because it's never, yeah. doesn't seem like it could ever be more timely. Will it be received well across the red-blue divide now, do you think, or not? Well, I think everyone's going to claim it. You know, he was a Republican who yeah. abolished slavery. Um, there certainly will be debates about what motivated him. Was it, was it to preserve the Union, or was it a, an abolitionist um, predisposition? So, but I think there's enough base patriotism to the story and something to inspire everyone or most people. So I, I think that it will be debated but embraced. I have just one or two short questions to ask you and then I'm gonna invite questions from, from the audience. One is, in any line of work, there's something that everybody inside of it knows that people outside don't know. For example, when I was working in politics, the thing everybody knows there is that everybody is fatally tired all the time. Fatigue is the main explanatory factor in a lot of politics. What's the case in your industry? What does everybody, what do all of your friends know that we don't know? Um, well, f about my part of it, I mean, there's lots of things that not everyone's a jerk in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I read all the time, that's the key. That is the key to, to success. If you have the material, you will get the right people to do your movie. It's not who you know, it's not who you go to lunch with, it's not what parties you go to. I haven't gone to a party in 500 years. <laughs> um, Are you free tonight? <laughs> not, um, and all I do, and love to do is read, and my friends know that when I say, you know, stop, I'm, I'm working, I would be doing it anyway. I would be doing it anyway. I love it, that's the, my favorite part of it, and, and, um, and I, have to go, I have to weed through a lot to find the good stuff. Now, are you an outlier in that, or, or are there a lot of people who would say the same thing, do you think? I think I'm a bit of an outlier. You have to do some, but I think a lot of people rely on other people's recommendations. I heard it's good, so I'll buy it, or so-and-so, a big important person wants to do it, so I should do it. Um, I think that Stephen and I read a lot because that discovery is so exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a similar question, what do, you, what do you know about us that we don't know about ourselves? By virtue of what you produce captures our imagination, what, what do you know about us? I, I do think that there is, at least now, an impulse toward um, event that you want something that requires you to get out of the house. That it, that we're not as um, you were not your constant companion anymore. You're you're falling in love with other people. <laughs> what can I say? And so, in order to attract your distracted yeah. attention. Um, we need to promise you something that is galvanizing, electrifying, um, transcendent in some way. You know, the help promised and delivered a powerful emotional experience. Lincoln promises and delivers a, uh, a, a unique and quality and never before told part of history. So, so you, you are demanding of us curating and, and selection. It's the, it's the what can women have everything yeah. kind of, of headline is required. I think we're in the same boat. Please come to the microphone while I ask you one, one last question. If there are, if you'd like to ask a question, please uh, assemble here. For your advice to young people, especially young women who are considering getting into the industry, would you tell them it's a good idea and what, what, should, they, what should they do? 
I'm in a legacy business, you know, so I don't know. I, I would, um, you know, I, I do think that, that content, and I hate calling movies content because to me they're more special than that, but you can't sell iPads and you can't sell smartphones without something to watch on it. So I do think that that is still a business, but the movie movie business is, is a legacy business and for, for um, you know, young people considering it, I would be looking at companies like Amazon or Netflix or, or Google or whatever to see what they're looking for, not the studios. Well, wow, interesting. Yes. Hi, Stacy. Could you tell us how you're using social media to drive revenue? I mean, you're competing with new media, uh, but you're also using it. And what are you doing beyond just engaging with consumers? How are you using to, to actually deliver results on your movies? Well, you know, to be honest, in, in the movie business right now, our thrust is still trying to cut our marketing costs and use it as a, as a marketing tool. We're, we're, we're uh, we deliver our movies on Netflix and Hulu and all the other platforms and we're ubiquitous that way. But we're not, we have not abandoned our traditional model, which is theatrical release, you know, home entertainment. And we can't, the cost of production is still too high for us to offer it directly um, uh, on, you know, online. And um, so social media for us still is engaging with our fans and encouraging them to buy tickets. Yes, over here. Yeah, hi, th th thanks for this very stimulating presentation. So um, this may sound a little funny, but uh, I was an undergraduate in the 1970s at uh, Yale University and an interesting episode then was that Playboy magazine came through to take photos of Ivy League undergraduates, and it triggered a conversation about the appropriateness of this in an era when women were trying to mm -hmm. advance themselves in the career. Uh, a few years uh, ago, I read a, uh, uh, some kind of interview by one of the early flag bearers of, of feminism. I think it was Gloria Steinem, but I'm not sure. And uh, she had a lot of interesting things to say, of course, but, but one, of, one of her points, summary points, was that in her perception, feminism had been trumped by narcissism. And when I read that, I was thinking back to this episode at Yale as perhaps a very early expression of that very same debate. And I thought, what a great person to, to, to reflect on well, this I, as, a, I'm, as an I'm executive. Not because I'm not knowledgeable enough, but there is, a, uh, there is an, a, a writer who has, been, who has written about, well, it's the whole, I mean, look, I don't want to get into it here, guys, but it is that whole idea of what, you know, is pornography pro-feminist or not pro-feminist? We should discuss this at a later date. <laughs> um, but but, I, but I, I, was, I was trying to make, a, I, think, I think, a more, a more substantive question is what is, what is the, as, as someone who's a successful executive, someone in the movie business, but also with teenage girls, you have to think about what do you, what do you want what do your, what, what well, do you want okay, them to Okay, I'll give you an to? example. Yes. That's a good question. I would not even finish reading, and I, I, I pass no judgment. I pass no judgment, ladies or men in the audience who've read this book, but for me, I was not interested in a movie version of Fifty Shades of Grey, Fifty Shades of Free, whatever it was. Um, and I don't judge what people do privately or read privately, but I just didn't feel that a presentation of women who would rather uh, be dominated was something that I wanted to put out there in the world, and it is ridiculously popular. It it has stayed on the bestseller list of every e combined, not e print everything, and I'm sure they'll make the movie for a dollar and make a trillion, <laughs> and it just doesn't interest me. And, and it saved Random House too, which is I guess a, a so. whole separate thing. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the movie industry as legacy industry. Where do you see how you're gonna, we are gonna see movies 10 years from now? How you see movies 10 years from now? I do think that day and date presentation is inevitable, where you can see it at home and see it in a theater. And I don't think theaters will go away, but I think that the closing of these windows will, and so you'll have the choice. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm used to going to movies. I've gone to movies my whole life. And, even, you know, if a movie is at 7.30 and I want to see it at 7.20, I'm annoyed. 
you know? I, I want to <laughs> see it when I want to see it. Or if I have to choose between dinner and movie or dinner too late, I'm too tired, too early. It, so I, I think that once you're accustomed to doing what you want to do when you want to do it, you have to offer that choice to consumers too. But the, the industry is holding on to the theatrical release because it's just much more lucrative than the rental transaction that you make uh, for pay-per-view. I have a self-indulgent quick follow-up here. I love going to movies. My wife doesn't, our only point of disagreement. I think there's something really different about seeing the gigantic theatrical screen. Is there any scientific basis for my feeling that? Um, Steven Spielberg agrees with you. So oh. <laughs> that's the science. Um, I watch movies all the time and something, I have had movies um, that I'm so proud of and, and we'll see in a small screening room and you start to feel flop sweat because nothing is happening, there's no reaction and you can't tell if people are liking them. And it's an entirely different experience. You take the same movie and you put you know, 100 people or 200 people in the audience and they feed off one another's reactions. So I don't know if it's scientific, but I've it's seen it happen. good enough for me. Thank okay, you. I yes. vouch for you. <laughs> Thank you, this was a really terrific panel. Um, Two things. One, I may be perverse, but I love Tropic Thunder. <laughs> I really oh, thank did. You. <laughs> 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 Me too. I'm Two. a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. <laughs> <laughs> Two, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the politics of a movie release. I mean, when you said that Lincoln is going to be released, you know, starting November 9th. Uh, while it may have been fortuitous that the movie made, was made now, November 9th doesn't seem to be an accidental date, coming as it does, obviously, a couple of days after the presidential election. Could you talk about that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, that the movie got made this year, to be for real, there were no conspiracies. It all had to do with um, Daniel Day-Lewis's schedule. And with an actor like Daniel Day-Lewis, it's a long, really long courtship, even, even from someone like Steven Spielberg, and there's a window and you seize upon it. But the decision to release the movie uh, November 9th um, was selected, or the decision was made, because what we came to realize soon, is, um, or quickly, is that our audience mostly is people that are engaged mm. In, mm. in news and popular culture and what's going on. And they were never going to be more receptive to our message than they are now. Stephen didn't want the movie released during the election season because he didn't want to confuse that we are ultimately entertaining. The movie will make your heart race, it makes you cry, it's profound, it's emotional, it's personal. It's, it's, it really takes a peek into what it might have felt like to be him. So we didn't want the movie to be mi mistaken for a, uh, a diatribe of any sort, but we knew that our audience would be receptive now. So our marketing efforts are now, and this also happens to be within the season that if we're lucky enough to receive any award, recognition that we'll still be eligible. And a quick follow up here, was the view of the Clint Eastwood convention appearance any different in the industry than it was for the public at no. large? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes. Um, maybe I could uh, indulge you in two questions, maybe the, the small and the large. The small is just um, ticket prices at the box office. Do you think it's time that big movies that cost 150 million to make should come at full price and that other interesting independent <laughs> smaller budgeted movies should be priced differently at the box office. There's a consent decree that prevents any, you know, collusion or price fixing and, and get studios getting together. And so that's always hampered this kind of idea of, of um, variable ticket pricing. But the example I gave you of arbitrage is where you'll see it happen. You know, I just put on Apple TV and I, I don't remember what it cost, but it was some, I think it was under $5. And, Richard Gere, Susan Sarandon, great story. And um, that company anticipated that you and I wouldn't want to spend full price and go out on a Friday night to see that, so they made it available to us cheaper and easier. 
Very well. Thank you. Can I leave, indulge you in one other, the bigger if it's, question? If it's terse. Uh, <laughs> yes. The long-term future of uh, DreamWorks. I wonder if you could comment <laughs> with this backdrop. Filmmaker-driven studios are, um, you know, are, are difficult to grow to the size to join the ranks of the big ones. Um, how do you chart the course for the next 20 years? and not suffer the gold crest problem. Yeah, there's a simple 10-second yeah. okay. answer. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that the abili our ability to grow organically and find uh, other opportunities, it, it's a better time for us now than it's ever been, because certainly the legacy, big, expensive, hulking studios that have thousands and thousands of employees are not the model. So the fact that we're small and nimble and able to seize upon uh, strategic alliances, which certainly is, is a possibility for our future, is where we see ourselves going. We have five more minutes total. I'd like to get all the questions, and then we can all write them down on a list. You can handle them all. So yes, your questions. My question, I, I was just interested in your comment on the uh, decline in the uh, power of stars uh, mm -hmm. to carry a movie, such a, and then you said, uh, um, well, the, that, the, uh, the, the global, and, 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 and yet you said Daniel Day Lewis yeah. may carry the movie. Yeah. Globally, I'll get a master it, list of the questions. Are you, okay. are you yeah. shifting to a, yeah. as an industry, is this, is this moving towards so more So declining of a, power of stars, great. Uh, okay. Yes. And <laughs> a historical rather than a, an industry question. I heard an interesting discussion somewhere about the debate over the timber and quality of Lincoln's voice. Mm. And I wanted to know, apparently Daniel Day-Lewis nailed it from what I understood. How does one find out how Lincoln spoke, what he <laughs> sounded like? <laughs> Good? Yes. I've been very interested in the conversation about how the economics drive the art uh, in movie industry and wanted to bring in television because it seems like over the past decade we've seen some really artful, small audience television shows like The Wire, Mad Men, Breaking Bad, even the TV version of Friday Night Lights yeah. had a very cinematographic quality mm -hmm. to yeah. it. Um, for much smaller audiences. And I'd just be interested to hear kind of your talk about how TV's evolving and the movie industry seems to be evolving to, towards much more big audience. Great, so we have this question about, uh, about TV and, and its role. We have the role of stars, which stars uh, still, still matter. And we have this um, historical technical question of how we know how Abraham Lincoln sounded. All right, I'll start with that one. <laughs> there, it was about 10 or 12 years before the audio recording devices mm -hmm. were, were available, but many, many people spoke about a shrill tenor. I mean, wrote. They wrote that, uh, that Lincoln spoke with a tenor, and it was described sometimes as shrill. So, you know, there were lots of written uh, records about what he sounded like. And Daniel, his, his performance is, is impeccable. And what you'll see is that at different times, his voice has a different register. I think that's uh, the second piece, if you guys Google it, uh, the, the two minute piece that we had following the debate, he, he, he really roars when he yeah. says, I am the president clothed with immense power, clothed in, clothed in immense power. And uh, his voice is, is uh, it's appropriate and, and compelling. Um, when it comes to the decline of stars, yes, there are still pe there are still stars out there where their the promise of their performance is so unique, and they've maintained their star status so impeccably that audiences will still come out for them. Meryl Streep, Daniel Day Lewis, Will Smith. I'm trying to think of more. There aren't that many more, believe it or mm. not. Um, what happened is that the the costs of Movies accelerated at such a great pace. The cost of movie stars accelerated at such a great pace. And the, and the international marketplace expanded all at the same time. It was kind of a perfect storm. So the best way to respond to that, thought the studio executives, um, was to create global event films that could be made with anyone. Hmm. So <laughs> Avengers, or The yeah. Mummy, or Fast and Furious, or um, Thor, or Superman, or Batman, and it didn't require a, a star. These, these were global properties, global franchises. If you want to make more than one, you get a less expensive young kid and sign them up for five movies. But what happens at the same time if you're not cultivating 
movie stars, and even, even since the golden age of the studio system, even when I have been a part of the movie business, we built movie stars. And so you could, the, the, the audience for Meryl Streep or, or, or Daniel Day-Lewis don't just come because we've had nothing to do with it. It's a, it's a, a promise between studio and, and actor. Anyway, more and more effort went into the other kind of movie, less effort went mm. into the building of stars, and the audience, this, the, after Julia, Tom, Will, Tom Cruise, et cetera, this next generation has been, has been cultivated on Twilight, and, and the, the properties were bigger than yeah. the stars. And if you put Rob Pattinson and maybe even Kristen Stewart or Taylor Lautner in another movie, if it's not Twilight, pretty much, not exclusively, they're not going as much. I don't want to say they're not going at all, but they're not going as much. Um, and so, and that, that you know, with, with television, which I don't work in as much, all the shows, with the exception of Friday Night Lights, that were referenced are cable shows. Mm -hmm. And those cable channels um, win by way of su subscriptions. So they're not win winning by way of Nielsen points. So if they sign what, one more uh, a client, one more subscriber, they win. So they're, they're playing a prestige uh, uh, quality game. Friday Night Lights was based on our film and done for the network that owned our company, NBC Universal, and only stayed on because they didn't have the heart to take it off. It wasn't, it wasn't commercially successful. There are questions I'd like to ask for another three hours, but I, 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 please join me in expressing our deep gratitude to Stacey Snyder for this performance. That was great.